Welcome to this final week of our series through the Gospel of Mark. We hope you've enjoyed hearing from some of our pastors over this journey as we have entered the holiest of weeks, approaching the hope of Easter. My name is Jason Gant and I serve as the location pastor of our West Campus in Olathe, Kansas, where K7 and K10 meet. This week we are taking a deeper uh, dive into Mark chapters 11 through 14. I will be focusing on Jesus' teachings in Mark 12 for this study. Mark 12 is all about questioning Jesus, questioning his authority as the people reveal their own hypocrisy. Do you remember pop quizzes in school? Well, I do. It's the moment in class when I'd be thinking as fast as I could of how to get out of this class. Should I fake ill? Should I lie about the principal asking me to come to the office and I, and I forgot? Should I make up a story about my parents coming now to check me out for a dentist appointment? My palms would begin to, to be sweaty and, and if I was really unprepared, I'd start considering notions of cheating. What could I write on the inside of my hand? Whose answers can I see from desk to desk? I confess this to you now because I am a great sinner and I am in constant battle of ethical choices in my mind and my heart. Maybe you can identify with that. But Jesus, Jesus is always prepared for the pop quiz. He's questioned time and time again, tested at every turn of his ministry, yet always has the answer we wish we would have thought of. He doesn't just offer the truth beyond what our minds could have conceived. He offers expanded teaching and even sometimes a little hyperbole to really make it sink in. Testing Jesus could be considered by some very prudent, even a responsibility the religious leaders have on behalf of the community, right? However, it's their motive that concerns me. And this is what I hope, well, to serve us all in self-reflection, because I can't help but being reminded as a part of the religious establishment where most of Jesus' corrections seem to be pointed Let's first look at Mark 11, which we walked through at the beginning of this week on Palm Sunday weekend. We recognized a key understanding of this moment when Jesus chooses a lowly donkey to ride upon as he enters the great city. He enters the temple courts and in frustration for the merchants and the religious leaders abusing their power, he upturns tables. He makes quite a point of course correction of the intention of his father's house. He offers a short but powerful teaching reminding us to turn to prayer for what we need and to forgive others so that we may also receive that forgiveness. It's almost a foreshadowing to one of the tests that are coming up to turn toward God and to forgive others. Now, here is where the testing, the questioning begins in Mark 12. The elders and lawyers come to Jesus to question his authority to do such things. He responds rather satirically. That is to say, I know the true motivation of your question, and so I'm not going to dignify it with a straight answer. Right at the end of Mark, we read this, uh, Mark 11. By what authority are you doing these things? Jesus replies, I will ask you a question, and if you can answer it, then I'll tell you why. When I was baptized by my cousin John, was it from heaven or from human origin? They don't know how to answer. And Mark writes that they feared saying it came from the power of heaven. Well, because then they would be forced to follow Jesus to recognize him as the Messiah. If they said it came from human origin, then that meant they questioned John, the baptizer, Jesus' own cousin, his prophetic voice. And he was loved by the people. You know, each time Jesus is tested or questioned, he has something to teach us. But do we listen to it? Or do we continue to focus on our own agenda, our own will? We must ask, what are the motivations for our questions, for our testing of Christ? We can't listen to this story and not recognize our own place in it. They simply decide not, not to answer. And so Jesus responds, then I will not answer you either. Now that's a drop the mic type of moment. Jesus could have walked away from their darkened hearts and let them revel in their choices, but he doesn't. Instead, 
he goes on to teach a parable. Jesus says this, A man planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it. He dug a pit for the press. He built a watchtower. And then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and moved on to another place. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of that vineyard. But they seized him. They beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Jesus goes on to say, Then he sent another servant to them, and they struck this man on the head, and they treated him shamefully. He sent still another, and that one they killed. He sent many others. Some of them they beat, some they killed. He had left one, uh, one uh, left to send, the scriptures say, his son, whom he loved. And he sent him last of all, saying, They will respect my son. But the tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come on, let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they took this son and they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. Now, this is clearly a pointed parable, which begins with what could be interpreted as allegory of Israel uh, rejecting God's continued saving grace. But then becomes clearly more than allegory when Jesus shares that the vineyard owner will send his son, whom he loves, and they kill him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and he will kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. Jesus says, haven't you read the passage of scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. And Jesus goes on. He says, then the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd. So they left him and went away. This is even more pointed now. Truly, it's an indictment. And they understand it's directed squarely at them. But do they learn from this lesson? Mark continues by sharing later that they sent others to look for ways to trip up or intimidate or at least humiliate Jesus. And scripture says this, they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to the, who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They go on to say it's right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not. Should we pay or shouldn't we? You see, they're trying to trip Jesus up, but he knew their hypocrisy. He says this, why are you trying to trap me? Bring me a denarius and let me look at it. And they brought him the coin and he asked, whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give back to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God's. Mark writes, and they were amazed at him. I love how Mark says they were amazed. It implies they really thought they had him. Yet you can't outwit Jesus. He's always prepared for the pop quiz. He is God in the flesh and he's prepared for any test we throw at him. And again, it's still not enough. Now the Sadducees step in and they question him about Mosaic marriage law. He uses it as a platform to help us have a greater understanding of the nature of God. And the nature of God is life, eternal life, resurrection life. Look to live, he teaches them. And then at the end of Mark 12, my favorite challenge in all of the gospel of Mark. You can read it starting at verse 28. We know it today as the greatest commandment. Scripture says this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard him debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he said of him, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment greater than these. If I were to ask you if you could name the Ten Commandments. Could you do it? Well, Jesus does it right here. He, in fact, sums up all of the laws, but especially the Ten, into the greatest commandment. Love God and love neighbor. They are one and the same, never to be separated. Any separation of it isn't the whole of the gospel. Proverbs 7.3 says that we are to bind them on our fingers and write them on the tablet of our heart. So we're going to do just that. You see, scriptures aren't just for memorizing. It's for applying to your life 
It's for the living. That's what Jesus is hoping through all of this. He wants our lives to be more than an exercise in testing his authority or heeding his warnings. He wants us to live it, to live the resurrected life. Easter isn't just about saving our lives through faith in him. It's also about following what he models in his resurrection. We are to die to the old and live to the new. And I get frustrated when people interpret that means the Old Testament is no longer relevant. No, they are the earliest of words, the first understanding of God's nature. And my hope is that we, it helps us understand the connection between Jesus teaching and the whole of the law. For he is the law, that is love. The love that is the law. And the Ten Commandments are exactly that. They are a love letter from God that is to be bound upon our fingers and written upon our hearts. Some of you know our Jewish friends will often pray with their fingers, bound in what's called tefillin as a part of their morning prayers, hoping to write these teachings upon their hearts. So I want to teach you a fun way to never forget how we love God and love neighbor. The first four commandments are about loving God with our heart, mind, soul, and strength. They are about our vertical relationship. And so I want to invite you, if you're sitting and, and watching this, or if you've got something in your hands, if you're watching with a phone, you might want to put it down. I'm going to invite you to use your hands. This is an interactive teaching, so join with me. Remember, I used to be a youth pastor for a lot of years. There is one God. I invite you to hold up your finger and just repeat it after me. The first commandment is there is one God. And this is clear from the beginning. God is enough. God's grace is enough, Paul writes. One God. Then we move to the second commandment. Do your fingers like this and say, cut out other gods. We cut out the other gods in our life. God helps us do this. And I don't know what God it is that is drawing you to its worship. It could be materialism. It could be popularity. It could be pride. It could be cheesecake. Anything can come between us and God. And if it is, you got to cut that out. The third, do not misuse my name. Do not misuse my name. And there's a side teaching here, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in a God who is for us, with us, and in us. This is how God works. And we represent God. So we never misrepresent or misuse God's name. Remember, the third commandment is much more than just stop cussing. It's about the nature of our character and how it represents God. And that brings me to the fourth of the first four commandments, which is hold up four, add four, and say honor the Sabbath. Now, it's important we don't misinterpret this. Often we think that Sabbath is, means, well, hey, I don't have to mow the yard today. I can just rest and watch football. And it is a day for rest but it's really intentionally meant to be a day, not about personal gain. The other six days are about personal gain, ambitious, all those kinds of things. But this Sabbath day is about honoring God. Time for God, a focus on God's will and not our own. So let's recap those first four. One God, cut out other gods, do not misuse or misrepresent Father, Son, Holy Spirit, my name and honor the Sabbath. Now these four connect us with loving God with heart, mind, soul, and strength. Now we move to the next six. Now the next six are what we like to call the horizontal. You can see the cross in this. How we treat others. And I think we needed more here because, well, this can be more difficult for us. But remember the whole of the gospel is loving God and loving neighbor. So these next six teach us how we love neighbor. So we come to number five. I invite you to make your hand like a salute because we honor our mother and father. We honor our mother and father. This is important. It's not just mother and father. It's all of the elders in our life. It's the coaches. It's the teachers. It's the people who pour their lives into us. We care for them in their old age. We love them and we learn from them. And I want to make sure you know, some of us have had a difficult challenge with a mother or a father, but God is our heavenly parent. God can be your heavenly father. That brings us to number six. I want to invite you to hold up five and a thumb because number six is do not murder. Now, you might be thinking, I got this one. All right, Whew. I got it. I can do this one. I haven't done this one. But here's the thing. Murder's about destruction. So the question is, what are you destroying? It's really about not destroying, but building up. 
And all too often in this world and in this life, we become destroyers. We destroy people with our words, or our actions. We destroy the environment. We don't toil or care for God's world. We are not to be destructive, but to be building up, to encourage up in love, the scriptures say. That's the deeper meaning behind this particular commandment. Now we move to number seven. Number seven, hold up five and a two. And I'm gonna take you back to when you were young because you might remember I mentioned earlier, I was a youth pastor for a lot of years, but it applies at every age. You're at a party and you're dancing. Come on, do it with me. We're having fun, make those dancing fingers. And then you're at the party, everybody's having a great time, but then two of you decide to go away together. No, do not commit adultery. God desires us to experience a monogamous committed relationship. And when we treat it as if it's not important or just out for self gain, we do an injustice to this incredible gift of relationship. Do not commit adultery. That brings me to number eight. I wanna invite you to hold up all fingers for number eight because we're reminded that even in some countries today, if we steal, we could lose our thumbs. Do not steal the eighth commandment. It's more than just grabbing something with your hands. It's about being takers or being givers. Who will you choose to be? God is calling us to choose to be givers and not takers. That brings me to number nine. I was not only a youth pastor for a lot of years of my life, but I grew up and come from the great state of Florida. And so this is a bit of an homage to number nine, which is do not lie or your nose will grow like Pinocchio. A little fun to remind us that what we say, what our words mean, what our word can mean, it defines our character, our integrity, our representation of God. So we do not lie. We live a life that is truth and honest. Do not lie. The final, the tenth of the commandments. Take all ten fingers and look over the fence at what others have. No, we do not envy. Instead, turn that around and look at what we have, the blessings in our lives, the things that have been poured out that we often take for granted, and often their relationships and experiences. And all too often, we get drawn into the de deception of, of looking at what others have or what job they have or life they live and imagining that fantasy that we want to be them when we have great things to be grateful for now in our lives. These are the Ten Commandments. One God, cutting out other gods. Do not misuse God's name. Honor the Sabbath. Honor your mother and father. Do not murder. Do not be a destructive person, but a productive person. Do not commit adultery. Treat that with respect. Do not steal. Do not lie. And do not envy. Jesus sums these all up in his interactions with the lawyer, which is different than all the others in Mark 12. The lawyer affirms Jesus's response as the correct answer to his pop quiz. Here's what he says. Well said, teacher. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask Jesus any more questions. This lawyer understood, do we? I think that's the question we're meant to ask from these few chapters of Mark, or really every Lenten season as we consider what Jesus has done for all the world. Stanley Hauerwas, who's one of my favorite theologians, was once asked when he was saved. He was named Time Magazine's Theologian of the Year some time ago, and when he was asked this question, he responded this way, I was saved 2,000 years ago on a cross. I feel like Dr. Hauerwas also knows the answer to the pop quiz, but it's more than just knowing the answers. It's living them. It's binding them on our fingers as we live into his hands and feet and voice in this world. It's writing them on our hearts so deeply that they become the nature of our character. So when the next pop quiz comes our way, and it will, we will face the temptations every day. We will face brokenness every day. We will, if we open our hearts, begin to see them as opportunities to love God and to love neighbor rather than question or test God. 
let's get the pop quiz right. Let's together do the next right thing and let's live the abundant life Christ speaks of through the hope that is to come and that is Easter. Amen.